of our fellowship series uh, in which a group of students attends weekly dinners uh, and talks with guests such as Peter Singer, Steven Pinker, or Darren Asimoglu. Uh, if you are interested in the idea of effective altruism or in the idea of having dinners with, with such luminaries, don't forget to fill in uh, the feedback forms, uh, which is the easiest way to get in touch with us. And also don't forget to attend our upcoming events, which my co-president Angie will tell you about. So this week, from April 12th to 17th, Monday to Friday, is our first Harvard Effective Altruism Week. Um, during this week, we'd like to encourage you all to think about your values and visions for the world, and then also think about how we can translate these intentions into effective actions. Tomorrow, we have an OCS career panel on earning to give. Uh, Tuesday, we have MIT economist Darren Achimoglu on uh, states and rights. He's the co-author of Why Nations Fail. And last, we have a competition for a career coaching package from 80,000 Hours, which is an organization that helps find the ideal career paths for people to maximize their possible positive impact on the world. And last, to introdu introduce tonight's guest, we have Professor Josh Green uh, of our own Harvard Moral Commission Lab. Peter Singer needs no introduction, but that's not going to stop me. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it, the, the simplest way to, to summarize uh, the, the long list of things you might say about Peter Singer is that he's hands down the most influential living philosopher. And when I say that, I don't just mean living philosophy professor, someone who has a PhD in philosopher. I really mean one of the most influential living thinkers. Uh, and not only is he influential, I mean, you know, there are a lot of bad people who've been influential, but he's been influential in the best possible way. I don't think that there's anyone whose ideas have had a more uh, positive impact on the world in, in, in my lifetime. So, you know, to, some the, to get some of the basic biographical details out, so Peter Singer is widely credited with being one of the founding people of the animal rights movement, or the animal liberation movement, and he has made important contributions and has had very sort of groundbreaking ideas about almost every, a, a, every aspect of, of bioethics and really ethics more broadly. Um, but the, 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 the line of work, the line of thinking that really brings us here tonight uh, to me, it's the one, at least the one that's had the, the, the biggest impact on my life. So it goes back to a, a paper that, that Peter published in the early 70s called Famine, Affluence, uh, and, and, and Morality. Uh, and he made a, a very simple and compelling and yet radical argument. He said, if there was someone who was dying right in front of you, you would be a moral monster if you just let that person die. This is a child who's drowning in a pond, and yet there are lives that we could save all over the world that we don't think that we're monstrous for not doing anything about it. Um, now, I, I actually encountered this idea, someone described this, this question, this problem, this dilemma to me in high school, and I, I could not get it out of my head. Uh, and I kept thinking about it and thinking about it, and then a couple of years later, I got to college, I was an undergrad philosophy major here, and I, I, I read his book, uh, Practical Ethics, and then later, later read, read that paper, and I was like, oh, this is the guy. This is where, where this all came from. And it wasn't just that one idea, but this whole set, this whole coherent framework, this whole approach, uh, as Alex said, of, 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 of applying reason and evidence to the problems that, that, that we face. Um, and part of what's been amazing to me is to see the change that's happened even over, over, over my own lifetime, over my own career, in terms of the influence and receptivity of, of, of Peter Singer's ideas. I mean, he's always made a splash, he's always had a following, but I don't think I've ever seen anything like this. When I, when I, was, when I first read Singer as, as, as an undergrad, uh, it was someone who was put in front of you to say, well, clearly this can't be right, but it's interesting to figure out where he goes wrong, right? And I was sitting there in the back of the room saying, I think he's right. Uh, and, and, and I know this sounds kind of crazy, and I'm not sure that I can live up to the standards for myself that this implies, but I can't really see the flaw in the argument. And, and then it stayed with me, as I said, over time, and, and, and really became the driving force, not only behind so much of what I've done professionally, I'm a, I'm a philosopher and I study moral decision making, but also personally as well in terms of how I, I allocate my, my, my resources. So uh, Peter Singer has been a hero of mine for a long time, but more importantly and, 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 and delightfully, increasingly he seems to be a hero of more and more people. 
and, uh, and, and his good works and good ideas seem to be, to, to be spreading and spreading. Uh, there was never anything like this uh, when, 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 I was on, when, when I was on the other side. And it seems that uh, the, 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 his influence keeps growing and growing. Uh, so he, he spent some 30, 40 years trying to convince the world that we, in the affluent world, we who sort of mostly by luck, by, by, by privilege, have this power to dramatically improve the lives of, of, of people we don't know. And he spent a long time trying to convince people, often a great uphill battle, that this is something we ought to take seriously. This is something we ought to act on. And now I feel like we finally entered phase two, where there is a, a, a critical mass of people uh, who say, of course, of course that, 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 that seems, seems right. And you know, there's a, sort of a, a snarky and somewhat cynical saying we have in, in academia, you say that the ideas advance one funeral at a time. Uh, and that's not true, but there's a grain of truth to it, which is that sometimes when the right ideas come along, the world isn't quite ready, at least most of the world isn't quite ready. And, 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 and what I see now is that the world is increasingly ready for uh, these ideas to take hold, and I think that that's where, that's why the effective altruism movement uh, is, 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 is taking off now, and there's really no more positive development that I can imagine for the, for the world of ideas or for the, for the world at large. So we are uh, here to hear about uh, Peter's new book, The Most Good You Can Do, How Effective Altruism is Changing, changing Ideas About Living Ethically. Uh, as I've said, Peter Singer is, is, is one of my great heroes, and I'm sure to, to many of you out there, and I'm delighted to hear what he has to say and to have him here on our campus. Please welcome Peter Singer. Adapted from a blog by Holden Karnofsky 
co-founder of GiveWell, and I'll say a little bit more about uh, GiveWell and Holden later on. I've, I've uh, tweaked it a bit in ways that uh, I seem to me to be slightly more accurate, but it's, it's broadly based on, on what Holden said. So, um, take a universal perspective. That is, we are concerned to improve the world, not just the bit of it that we happen to live in, or some other small part of it. Um, you could say, philosophers sometimes use the term cosmopolitan to distinguish somebody who wants to have a global ethical perspective from someone like a communitarian who wants to focus on their particular community. Uh, so, uh, effective altruists uh, are cosmopolitans in that sense. But you might then say, well, what are their major values? What do they think is going to improve the world? And the second line suggests, again, as I say, the kind of common core of what I would see effective altruists regard as improving the world. So reducing suffering is uh, something that I think pretty much everybody would agree would improve the world, certainly taken in itself. This doesn't mean that all suffering is on balance bad. Um, some suffering may be necessary to reduce to prevent further suffering. Uh, we might go to the dentist knowing that we'll suffer a little, but otherwise we'll suffer more. Um, and there are more major examples than that too. But the suffering in itself is bad and we would rather not have it. And of course there's a lot of suffering in the world, so if we can reduce that vast quantity of suffering in the world, we've done something good. Similarly, premature death is bad, at least the premature death of beings who can hope to have a good life, where um, the prospects of a reasonable life are, are there, or perhaps where somebody wants to go on living anyway, then we think it's a bad thing if their lives are cut short prematurely. And again, there may be other things that we would take into consideration here, but uh, this is certainly something that we would normally think of as bad. So that's all about the idea of, of well-being, promoting well-being. Now, uh, the next point is one that I think there is some variations on in range of importance among the effective altruists, and that is, if we say that suffering is bad, do we only take into account the suffering of human beings? And I'm pleased to say that I think pretty much everybody in the effective altruist movement would agree with me that species in itself does not determine the badness of suffering. That is, it, it can't be just the fact that you're a member of a species Homo sapien that means that your suffering is bad. The suffering of members of other species is also bad. I put in the how much with a question mark to indicate that there is some disagreement here about how you weigh that suffering of animals against the suffering of humans. Um, and I think the best way to understand this is not is not that it's questioning whether similar amounts of suffering are equally bad when it happens to a human or an animal, but rather it's questioning how do we know how much animals really can suffer as compared to humans whom we can talk to and who can tell us what it's like for them. So I think I'd be surprised if there's anyone in the room who really doubts that a pig can suffer, for example. But um, if somebody says for a breeding sow to be locked in a stall too narrow for it to turn around or even walk a single step, which is the situation for still, unfortunately, I think the majority of the breeding sows that produce pigs in factory farms. Um, if somebody says, that's just as bad as a human being locked in those conditions, well, we might well disagree about that. We might say, it's not the same for various reasons because of the different cognitive capacities. Both of them matter, but can the, can the sow suffer as much as a human? That's, that's a question where I think there is room for disagreement and room for further discussion and investigation. Now, um, the next line is also one where I think you would generally find in the effective
think of altruism movement, <coughs> that people think that principles like justice, equality, and fairness, and perhaps also some moral rules, matter to some extent, or ought normally to be given weight. You might say it's kind of a pro tanto sort of thing, that uh, if two courses of action, one will better promote equality, justice, and fairness, then that's what you should do. But not necessarily that they're overriding, nor even necessarily that they're intrinsically important. That is, I think quite a few effective altruists, maybe the majority, would think that they're important because they tend to promote well-being. Because of society that recognizes principles of equality, justice, and fairness is likely to be a society in which people have better lives. <coughs> and then there would be some debate, I think, as to whether, apart from that, these principles are intrinsically important, whether they matter in themselves. And some people uh, would say that they would, and some would say they wouldn't. And I think those who say that they would could still claim to be effective altruists as long as they are also giving weight to well-being. So they might say, yeah, there's some kind of trade-off. If something, one, one action is just and the other is unjust or less just, as I said, pro tanto, they might want to do the, the just one, but if it was clear that there was going to be much more suffering in the long run, if they did that, um, then they might think that this was our way. Or take the question of, of equality, we might normally think that helping the worst off actually promotes greater well-being, because we can usually use our resources more effectively to help the worst off. And indeed, that's what I'll be arguing when I talk about global poverty in a few moments. But should we help the, help the worst off, even if it were clear that we could make a bigger gain in well-being by helping people who are not the worst off, but somewhere in the middle? Followers of John Rawls would say, no. I think most effective altruists would say, well, possibly, if the gain in well-being were big enough anyway. Um, so, uh, I think that's something, again, on which how exactly you make that trade-off, whether you give weight to the fact that some are worse off than others, independently of trying to improve well-being, would be something where there's some disagreement about. And finally, I think effective altruists would hold that we should seek to maximize expected value. So very often people will say, look, what you're talking about are setting up programs and uh, organizations, various kinds, that are directed towards the future. Some of these to the quite distant future, perhaps. But how can we know exactly what will have the best consequences? Especially when we project in the future, but even in other cases as well. Well, we all know about aid programs, for example, that have gone wrong. So, what we want to maximize is the expected value, or what we should use as a basis for our choice is expected value, in the sense that if one action will have a big payoff, but there's a significant probability that it won't happen, and we're comparing that with another action that has a smaller payoff, we're much more confident that it will happen. What we want to do is to discount the payoff by the probability of whether it will happen or not. So a 10% chance of gaining 100 units of well-being is, on this view, equivalent to the certainty of gaining 10 units of well-being. Uh, as I say here, uh, some people would say, well, um, there are some moral rules that are absolute side constraints. That we, never, we, we ought not to do some actions if they violate a moral rule. And again, um, I don't want to exclude such people from the broad umbrella of effective altruism. What I'm saying here really is, I don't think you have to be a consequentialist or a utilitarian in order to be an effective altruist. Because you could say, there are some things that I would not, not do, no matter what the consequences. There's a famous example in uh, Brothers Karamazov about um, would you torture this child here if that was the way to produce happiness on earth forever after? 
And some of us, utilitarians, and I count myself as one, would say, well, it would be very hard to do psychologically to torture this small child. But after all, I would have to think that if I don't do this, there will be thousands or perhaps millions of small children who will be tortured brutally in various ways in the world in the future. Or perhaps they'll die painfully of all sorts of illnesses. Whereas I now, fantastically, have the chance to stop all that by just torturing one. So I would say uh, I would hate to have to do that. I don't know whether I psychologically could, but I would think it would be the right thing to do. But um, if you say no, that would always be wrong. As Dostoevsky seems to be saying, as Alyosha is saying in The Brothers Karamazov, I think you could still be an effective altruist because most of the time you're not going to be asked to torture a small child. <laughs> so you can go on maximizing utility in all of those other circumstances. And there may be a few other rules that you want to keep as well. Okay, so that's a rough account of the, the key values. Now, where does this come from philosophically? I do just want to pay tribute to a late 19th century utilitarian philosopher that probably those of you who have not studied ethics will not have heard of, and unfortunately, even some of you who have studied ethics will not have heard of, because your professors will have made the mistake of giving you John Stuart Mill to read instead of Henry Sidgwick. Mill is admittedly a better writer. He also wrote a much briefer essay about utilitarianism than Sidgwick did. But Sidgwick is certainly the better philosopher. Um, so, having got that in, um, <laughs> this, this line from Sidgwick, I think, is, is basically his basis for what I had before about taking a universal point of view. He thinks that it's a kind of self-evident truth, a truth of reason, he would say, that... Um, the good of one individual is of no more importance than the good of any other, he says, from the point of view of the universe, but he doesn't really think the universe has a point of view. That's, the, that's what the, if I may say so, in brackets, is about. It's a kind of a, a metaphorical way of putting this. Um, so uh, that's, you know, those philosophers who are kind of objectivists about values might agree with Sidgwick that this is a truth, a uh, moral truth. Some others would want to say no, but it nevertheless is a fundamental attitude that I, that I hold and that I encourage others to hold. There's a variety of views on the nature of ethics here. But I think something like this lies behind the idea of effective altruism and its universal stance. Okay, whoops, sorry, I'm too fast now. I want to now talk about some of the people in the movement who've been influential in starting the uh, effective altruism movement over the last few years and getting it going. And I think uh, I, I give a lot of credit to Toby Ord here, um, who is the founder of uh, Giving What We Can, uh, one of the groups that uh, there are people representative of um, here, I think. Um, and Toby sort of, I guess, began his thinking about it in this way. He was uh, doing a, a doctorate in philosophy and headed for an academic career. Um, but he was still living on his graduate studentship, I think it was about £14,000 a year, and he felt that it was really enough to give him a reasonably good life. He didn't need a lot more than that. Um, but he realised that, presuming he did go on to have an academic career, he would be earning more over that career. So, being mathematically inclined, he decided to work out, firstly, how much he would be likely to earn over his entire career, and secondly, how much you would really need to live on over that career. And uh, he worked out, I think, that he would uh, earn something like uh, 1.7 million pounds at the current values of a, a few years ago, uh, and that he would be able to give away, I think, two-thirds of that. Or maybe two, the two-thirds was the 1.7, I can't swear that. You have, to, you have to get the book to check the figures. I've got them right in the book anyway. Um, anyway, he worked out that there would be this uh, quite large amount uh, of money that he would be able to give away. He then decided to think, what, how much good could that do? And he decided to look at how, how many operations could be performed to restore sight to people who are blind. So, one of the common cause of blindness is cataracts. Um, 
as people get older, they very often get cataracts. I would be surprised if there aren't many people in this audience whose grandparents or parents have had cataracts um, and had them removed. And pretty much, I would say, everybody in the United States who goes blind or even has impaired vision because of a cataract will have it removed. Either their health insurance will pay for it, or if they don't have health insurance and they're poor, uh, they will get it on Medicaid, or since most of them are probably 65 or above, they'll get it done on Medicare. But throughout the world, there are millions of people who do, cannot afford and do not have access to services that will remove cataracts. But it's quite an inexpensive operation. The marginal cost of doing an extra cataract operation um, seems to be somewhere between $25 and $100. Um, so you can divide whatever the figure was, if it was 1.5 million pounds, which would be more like, I guess, uh, over two million, two and a bit million dollars, you can divide that by 50 or 100 dollars and you can easily see that this is a very large number of people whose sight could be restored by your, give, by Toby's having given that element of his salary that he thought he didn't need to organizations that were effectively working in this way. So he was surprised by that. He thought this was an immense amount of good that he should do. And he therefore pledged to live on a somewhat similar modest amount, 18,000 pounds a year, um, which uh, of course gets adjusted for inflation as the years go by. So it's probably already a little bit higher than that. Uh, and he is now following that academic career as a uh, research fellow in philosophy at Oxford. Um, I'll also point out that he's not a hermit living in a cave, he's a married guy with a mortgage and he now has a child uh, as well. Um, and his wife has made a similar pledge. Um, it's not as if he's living off a, uh, a wife who's an uh, investment banker. <laughs> uh, so I think, I, I think her pledge is, is roughly in the same sort of, sort of ballpark. Um, so, uh, this is an example, and, and Toby then decided to tell more people about this, so every people ought to know about how much good you can do with a relatively small amount of, of uh, you know, even with a relatively modest income. And um, so uh, he set up this organization, uh, Giving What We Can, together with Will McCaskill, who you see here, uh, who helped to found it. Um, and uh, the Giving What We Can website gives this kind of information on say more about that in a moment. Will also founded uh, this organization, which I think there's a little thing about there, 80,000 Hours, named for the number of hours that Will calculated the typical person would spend on their career. So the idea of calling it that was to make you appreciate that your career decision is an important decision that's worth thinking about. If you spend a bit of time thinking about what you're going to do in the evening or something like that, or where you're going to go on your vacation, um, then your career is a much more important decision, obviously. And yet quite a few people just more or less fall into a career that seems convenient without thinking too much about it. And uh, Will was, was trying to encourage people to think about this from an effective altruism point of view. That is, to think about careers that will effectively help to make the world a better place. Um, there's two other things before I come back to that. Um, firstly, uh, Will has actually just got an appointment as a fellow at Lincoln College in Oxford, so for next year he won't be a junior research fellow in Cambridge anymore. Um, secondly, uh, he's got a book coming out this year as well, um, Doing Good Better, and I've seen the proofs of that, and I think it's an exciting book, which um, certainly uh, doesn't clash a lot with mine, but develops other aspects of effective altruism. So I hope you'll look out for that when it, when it comes out. Okay, this is the website, 80,000 Hours, that, um, 80,000hours.org, that we'll set up. And uh, as you see, it is intended to provide career guidance. Um, now, Will thought when he looked at websites that do talk or that provide career guidance, 
and when he looked at what they say about to people who want to live an ethical life, um, I think he thought that it was pretty trite, really. It was fairly obvious sort of stuff that was not necessarily the only option. So it was saying things like, uh, well, you could work for, a, for an NGO, um, uh, find an NGO that's doing, doing good work, uh, perhaps an aid organization, for instance, and you could work for them, or you could go to medical school and become a doctor and work in a developing country. Uh, those are good things. They're fairly obvious and probably most people would be able to think of them. But Will thought that a lot of people would not think of deliberately choosing a career that would bring them a high income. So, for example, I mentioned investment banking a moment ago. Investment banking typically does bring high incomes. Could it also be an ethical career choice? Will's view was, yes, it could be, if you were going to use that income in order to do more good. So, whereas Toby Orr would say he's going to be able to donate as an academic, uh, maybe a million and a half pounds over his career, uh, a successful investment banker, a few years out of uh, into their position, could probably donate that in a single year if they wish to do so, and every year thereafter. So, if you would do that, you could do a lot of good. And Will argues that what you have to think about in considering whether you do more good as an investment banker than as an aid worker is the marginal difference that your career choice will make. So by the marginal difference, think of it this way. Suppose that you decide that you're going to be an aid worker and you see that Oxfam, Oxfam America, we actually have their headquarters just here in Boston, um, are advertising for a position in their office. So you apply for that position and let's assume that you get it and you work hard at that position and do a good job. How much difference have you made? Well, you can't say that the difference you've made is all the good that you've done while holding that position. Because if you had not applied for that position, presumably the next best candidate would have got the job. We're assuming that Oxfam have a reasonably good set of criteria for deciding who is the best candidate. So the difference that you're making by getting the job is the difference between the good that you do and the job that the second best candidate for the position do. And if there's a strong field, and very likely there would be, that's going to be a small kind of difference, not really a huge difference. Now, consider that you instead go into investment banking or Wall Street in some other way. In one sense, the same thing could be said. What you do for your employer, for the corporation, extra good that you do, is only the marginal difference between what you can do and what the second best applicant can do. But as an effective altruist, you're not really interested in doing the most good for the investment bank that you're working for. You're interested in doing the most good for the world. And it's very unlikely that the second best candidate for the investment banking job would donate as much of their income to effective charities as you as an effective altruist would do. So, everything that you donate as a result of earning a high income is additional. Additional to what would have happened if you had to take that job. And that could easily be enough to fund not just one, but two or three or more positions at Oxfam or at some other aid organisation, where all of the good that the people in those positions do would really flow from the fact that your donation had made it possible for Oxfam to employ those extra people. Now it's true that not everybody is going to really be able to do that. For one thing, not everybody is going to be able to get a high paid job uh, in finance or one of those other high paying sectors. Uh, so you may not simply be able to do it that way. But also, there are people who may not have the character to stick at something where they're not directly interested in what they're doing in doing the best for the company they're working for, but they're really doing it for what you might say is an ulterior motive, although in this case a 
an ethical ulterior motive to help as many other people as possible and to do the most good that you can. But I think some people can do this, and here's one of them. If you read Nicholas Kristof's column in last Sunday's, not today's, but a week ago's, New York, New York Times, this is the man he wrote about, Matt Wager, who was uh, a student of mine at Princeton and started thinking about these kinds of issues um, and made a decision, I think not, uh, not all just because of the course he'd taken with me or discussions he'd had with me, but, um, but because of other people in the community at, at Princeton and also at Rutgers at the time, there was a, an EA kind of group, rather, as there is at Harvard, and talking a lot to people there. Um, Matt, who seemed to be headed for an academic career, he'd um, done well in philosophy, he got the philosophy department's prize for the best senior thesis in his uh, final year, and uh, was offered a place in the graduate school at Oxford University. Um, <coughs> instead of taking that, he decided to take a job at an arbitrage firm uh, on Wall Street. So, um, this slide is a little bit old, he's now a couple of years after graduating, but uh, in the first year already, he was able to give a six-figure sum to <coughs> charities that he regarded as most effective, and, and still have enough to live on um, very comfortably. Uh, he also set up, helped to set up an organization that uh, spun off a previous book I wrote related to global poverty called The Life of Can Say. So, um, I had Matt back last year to uh, the, the, the class that he'd taken, talking to the students there, um, and he was asked uh, whether there wasn't a danger in backsliding. Probably this is something that you would have already thought of, many of you. Um, here he is, working on Wall Street, surrounded by people who are earning as much as he is or more, and he's spending that on essentially a very comfortable, more than comfortable, luxurious style of living. Um, they're probably driving Porsches or Ferraris or something. They may be buying themselves penthouses in Tribeca. Um, and isn't Matt getting envious of this? Doesn't he think, uh, yeah, you know, maybe you really do need a Porsche after all. <laughs> <laughs> so Matt's response was that uh, so far he hadn't really um, been tempted to adopt their lifestyle. And moreover, that by being public about what he was doing, and he talked about it in a variety of ways, and uh, uh, gave me permission to talk about him in, in the book, and obviously spoke to Nicholas Christoph for last week's column, by doing that, he feels he strengthens his own commitment to doing it. Because now, if he backslides, he's going to look a lot sillier than if he hadn't actually told anyone about what he was planning to do. So, um, you know, it's a, it's a good psychological strategy, I think, to uh, keep yourself, tie yourself up to the mark and not allow yourself to get corrupted over time. Okay, here's someone else who actually is here in the audience, Julia Wise. Um, and Julia is an example of, of a different approach, um, perhaps a little bit more like the Tobies, although not coming out of philosophy, but uh, just out of something that, that she always thought was right, even from when she was a teenager, that uh, she was fortunate to have so much, and there was, if she was spending money on herself in some way, she was taking it from someone living in poverty elsewhere in the world, and uh, as far as, as reasonably possible, she ought not to be doing that. So uh, she and her partner, Jeff, um, who was here but seems to have gone off with a child, um, uh, gave a third of their income even when they were earning less than $40,000 a year and living around this area, which some of you may know is not the cheapest part of the world to live in. Um, and now that uh, they're earning more, fortunately, they're able to give more. And if you want to read more about uh, Julia's thoughts and her lifestyle and how she does it, um, I highly recommend you look at her blog, Giving Gladly, which you can find the address there. So those are some examples of people in the effective altruism movement. I could go on for a long time. There are many, many more, but I think you get the idea, and I do have a few more in the book. 
I now want to move to looking at uh, one of the deeper philosophical issues that lies behind or the, cause, the choice of a cause that effective altruists can make or will make. Um, and this is something that people also uh, very often disagree with about, but um, I think it's, it's an example of how effective altruist thinking has the potential to change a very large industry in the United States. And that industry is philanthropy. It's very large because the total amount given to charity in the United States each year is, is around $335 billion. It's about 2% of uh, US GDP. So it's, it's, a, it's a big slice. And of that, the majority, about $240 billion, is given by individuals. Most of those individuals do no research at all into the charities that they donate to. It's only a, a minority who do any, and that, by any research, that really can be extremely fleeting. Look at uh, the website or information provided by the charity. So, if we can change that and make that 240 billion go to the most effective charities that there are, we will be making a huge difference to the world. Because as I say, this is a very substantial amount of money. Uh, it's something like more than 10 times the amount of US foreign aid, for example. Um, so we're talking about a lot of money here. And this is an example of the what is still the mainstream approach to charity. So this is from the website of Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors. Uh, a large player in the field of advising wealthy people about philanthropy. Uh, and as it says under the Your Philanthropy Roadmap, giving away money is simple, giving away money effectively is an entirely different matter. And I think everyone in the effective altruism movement would agree with that. <coughs> but when you probe more deeply into what RPA means by giving effectively, I think disagreements will start to open up. So you can probe more deeply by looking at a kind of online brochure that they have called Finding Your Focus in Philanthropy. And it pictures the field of philanthropy like this, which I think has a couple of mistakes in it from the start. Firstly, it, if you look at this chart and think, which area will I give to? you're missing a really important question, which is, will I give to organizations working in the United States, or in my own country if I'm an affluent citizen of another country, or will I give to organizations working in developing countries? So that's, that choice is not really presented here. I mean, you could say, well, you know, economic security, I could give to economic security here in America, or in sub-Saharan Africa, or uh, health and safety, I could give to improve health care in India, or I could give to improve health care here, uh, those will make very big differences to the effectiveness of what you're giving. Same with education, uh, but it's not shown here. The other thing that I notice here, um, given my interest, as uh, Josh said in introducing me, in uh, questions about the ethics of how we treat animals, is that animal welfare doesn't even get into this picture at all. There's really no category here um, in which somebody concerned about reducing the suffering of animals, at least reducing the suffering of animals other than wild animals in the natural environment, because I guess they could fall under the environment heading. Um, uh, that doesn't, doesn't seem to get in. It's just, just excluded by the initial picture of, of philanthropy. But that's not my biggest problem with RPA. It's rather what they say here. They say, what is the most urgent issue? And they then answer this question by saying, there's obviously no objective answer to that question. Uh, first, I don't think the question to ask is really what is the most urgent issue. It's rather what is the issue in which you can have the biggest impact. Because something might seem very urgent, like there was a hurricane in Vanuatu not very long ago. You might say it's very urgent to get supplies there people need help right now. But it's quite possible that that's not the most 
effective way of helping people in great need. It might be that there are ongoing areas of concern, like the deaths of children by diarrhoea all over the world, caused by poor drinking water or the lack of oral rehydration therapy, where you can actually do more good for <coughs> donations than helping people in Vanuatu. That's going to depend on the particular situation. But there are GiveWell, if you look at GiveWell's website, which I'll again talk about in a moment, you'll see some suggestions that humanitarian relief is not always where you can make the biggest difference. But the larger problem is this claim that it's obvious that there's no objective answer to that question. I don't think it's obvious at all. In fact, I think, on the contrary, it's obvious that for at least some choices, some are objectively better than others. In other words, there are choices where I think it's not that difficult to say one option is objectively better than the other. There are others where it gets more difficult, although I think perhaps there still is an objective answer, even if it's very difficult to reach it. Let's look at a couple of RPA's examples and see whether one is better than the other. So RPA talks about Ken Turner's $1 million donation to the United Nations to scale up already proven health programs against killer diseases killing largely children in developing countries. So diarrhea, malaria, measles, these sorts of things. Now, at the time when Ken Turner gave that, there wasn't much working, wasn't much being done, and it's been estimated that the cost per life saved was as low as $80. That's not saying that by giving to these programs today, you can save a life for $80. Um, certainly, the current research being done would show that the cost would be significantly higher. But that's because, you know, if you go into a new field, you go to the areas where the disease is most prevalent, where you can immunise children at risk most conveniently and easily, and therefore the cost per life save is lower. Once you've been doing that for 15 years, it'll go up. But compare that with RPA's, another of RPA's examples, and I was lecturing at Stanford just uh, a couple of days ago, giving a small talk. Uh, so this is a hospital that was set up in Palo Alto by Lucille Packard. Um, Palo Alto, if you don't already know it, is, I think, ranks as the third most affluent community in the United States. So it isn't like there is a great number of unmet medical needs for relatively simple, inexpensive <coughs> procedures. Um, and among the things that the hospital has been in the news for is spending between one and two million dollars to separate a pair of conjoined twins from Costa Rica. Now, that's a good thing to do, but if you can save a life for $80, or even if, let's say, you can save a life only for $1,000, or maybe even $2,000, to spend $2 million to separate one pair of conjoined twins doesn't seem to be the best use of your money. You could have saved, let's say, at least 1,000 lives for that. It's better, I would say, to save 1,000 lives than to separate one pair of conjoined twins, even if the twins would have died had they not been separated. And I don't know whether that's the case or not. So that's an example, I think, where you can make a choice because you're talking about fairly simple, similar things, saving lives and so on, um, at different costs for doing so. Let me give you uh, another example that was in the news just the other day. Um, David Geffen, who um, uh, is an entertainment mogul behind DreamWorks, for example, um, donated a hundred million dollars to what uh, may still be, but won't be for long, called the Avery Fisher Hall at the Lincoln Center in New York. Um, no prizes for guessing what it's about to be called. <laughs> and a hundred million dollars, incidentally, is not the full cost of renovating the hall. There was some debate as to whether he got a bargain in getting the naming rights, because the Lincoln Center says it will cost half a million dollars to renovate their hall. So, the question, and presumably they'll raise that from other donors, but in smaller amounts. Um, the question here really is, what else could David Geffen have done with that amount of money? And uh, among the things that he could have done is, again, restore sight or prevent blindness. Um, I mentioned cataract surgery. This is preventing people from becoming blind. 
Dr. Cataract from trachoma, which is the leading cause of preventable blindness in the world. It's caused by a microorganism that gets in the eyes of children when they're quite young, in, uh, living in certain conditions, generally people in, in poverty. Um, it's a very slow, progressive condition. Gradually, their vision will become blurred. And uh, as they age, they will become completely blind. So typically, given the life expectancy of people in poverty, which is less than ours, but maybe 55 or 60 or something like that, typically they'll be blind for about 15 years. So again, this is something that can be very inexpensively prevented by a simple treatment, uh, ranging similar sort of costs from the cataract surgery, maybe 25 to 100 dollars per case of blindness prevented. So if you're giving $100 million to a concert hall uh, renovation, then that's a million cases of blindness uh, that could have been prevented. And I just think it's, it's obvious that there is an objective answer that that would be a better thing to do than to improve the concert-going experiences of those uh, wealthy Manhattanites and uh, other visitors to New York City who will go to concerts in the Lincoln Center. Um, now, uh, when I said this, people have sometimes commented, um, well, David Geffen has also given to medical research. He gave to UCLA uh, Medical School, for example. Um, in a sense, that's, that's not the point, because even if he did other things that were more good, here's $100 million that he didn't do the most good that he could have with. And as a factor altruist, I think that he should have done the most good he could with all of what he's prepared to donate. Uh, so this is a fact. This is um, expressing this kind of view uh, about the arts in a comment on the Christoph column that I mentioned um, in the Times just last week. Um, so it's sort of saying, well, what I'm doing here, because Christoph talked a little bit about that as well. What I'm doing here is um, playing off the arts against uh, other areas of human experience, reducing poverty. And why don't we do both? Well, my response to that is, if you've got a bank that will allow you to write a check for everything in your account to reducing global poverty, and then we'll write another check for exactly the same amount to the arts, uh, and we'll pay off both checks, please tell me who you're banking with, because I want to switch to them as well. We only have a certain amount of funds, and it's not a false choice, it's a real choice that we have to make what to do with those funds. Okay, uh, I want to say a little bit about effectiveness. I want to make sure that you have time for questions, discussion, so I'm going to whiz through this pretty fast. Um, here's GiveWell's website. Um, this is the organization that introduced a new rigor to assessing the effectiveness of charities. Until GiveWell got set up um, around 2007, the, uh, the only thing you could find out really online about charities was what percentage of their funds went to administration and fundraising and what percent went to programs. And a lot of people still think that that's a key factor in deciding which charities are the best ones to give to. But you don't have to stop and think very long to realize that it's not. Suppose that you have an organization that is very concerned to cut its administrative costs and so has very few staff and therefore can say truly that only 10% of the funds it receives go to administration and the 90% goes to its programs. And suppose you have another organization that spends 20% on administration and only 80% goes to programs. Does it follow that the first is a better bet? Not unless you know that its programs are equally effective with the programs of the other one, or at least very close to equally effective. But you don't know that, and in fact the fact that they've got fewer staff means that it's quite likely that they won't be, because they don't have so many staff to decide which are the best programs, to carefully research which programs they're going to fund, and then to monitor and evaluate whether the programs they're funding are, are working. So it's quite possible that 90% of your funds will go to programs, but those programs will only do, let's say, a tenth as much good as 
the programs, Panthers, 